and welcome back to my Amateur Radio General Class License Course. It's a wonderful day in the Amateur Radio neighborhood and a great day to learn some more about the fundamentals of electronics. Uh, while today's uh, Amateur Radio equipment uh, uses uh, quite sophisticated electronics, most of the uh, uh, principles are still the same though. Um, and it's been that way for the past century. Uh, even so, uh, components have improved in quality and they just keep getting smaller. They're all about teeny tiny little things. Um, many amateur radio uh, operators, however, uh, favor the vintage electronic equipment because uh, it's uh, easy to repair. Uh, you know, it's not like the, the small stuff that's really difficult to, uh, to work with. Uh, some of the older equipment, you can actually go in and find the wrong component and fix it uh, if you're inclined to do such things. Um, and of course, the first step of troubleshooting is to uh, give everything a good look over. It's called visual inspection. Um, being able to identify components is a, a rudimentary step in, in that process. Um, you know, if you see a capacitor that's blown to bits, it's obviously that it had a bad capacitor. Um, well, are you ready to learn? Well, let's get started. This is the Amateur Radio General Class License Course, Lesson 6. I'll be your instructor, Gary Stevens, Kilo Echo 2 Gulf Sierra, KE2GS. That's Kilo Echo 2 Gulf Sierra. This is sub-element G6. Uh, there's two exam questions out of the two groups of 27 questions total. Uh, this covers the uh, 2019 to 2023 general class FCC element 3 question pool, which was effective July 1st, 2019. This sub-element uh, covers circuit components. Uh, we're going to be talking about resistors, capacitors, inductors, rectifiers, solid state diodes, uh, transistors, vacuum tubes, batteries, analog and digital integrated circuits, memory, input-output devices, microwave uh, integrated circuits, uh, display devices, uh, connectors, and ferrite cores. How many of you can look at this photograph and recognize the resistors or the capacitors or the, or the types of resistors and capacitors? Can you recognize inductors or a rectifier? Can you spot the solid state uh, diodes or transistors? There's not any vacuum tubes or batteries in the pictures, uh, but there are some analog circuits. Um, if you can't recognize them right now, never fear. By the time that we're through with this uh, section or the sub-element, uh, perhaps you'll be able to. So let's dive into the resistors, capacitors, inductors, rectifiers, solid state diodes, and uh, transistors. Uh, dabble in vacuum tubes and even batteries. I encounter a question on the test that says, uh, what is the minimum allowable discharge voltage for the maximum life of a standard 12 volt uh, lead acid battery? Well, you can only discharge one so far before there's a point of no return. If you look at this, uh, this uh, chart, uh, you can tell that uh, there's a definite red, red uh, zone. So you can overcharge and undercharge uh, uh, lead acid battery. For the exam, you just need to know that the minimum allowable discharge voltage for the maximum life of a standard 12 volt lead acid battery is 10.5 volts. Don't let your batteries get below 10.5 volts. It shortens their life. Be asked on the exam, uh, what is the advantage of the low internal resistance of a nickel cadmium battery? Well, if you look at this chart, you can tell that uh, there's a, a discharge capacity that's uh, fairly high. And uh, uh, however, you also can notice that um, nickel metal hydride battery is superior. Uh, but for the exam, you need to know that the advantage of the low internal resistance of a nickel cadmium batteries is that it has a high discharge current. 
On the exam, you may be asked, that what is the approximate junction uh, threshold voltage of a germanium diode? Well, if you look at the, uh, the chart, uh, you can see that a germanium diode is right around 300 millivolts, which is 0.3 volts, uh, whereas a silicon uh, diode, uh, its threshold is over around 700. Uh, but for the exam, you need to know that uh, the approximate uh, junction threshold voltage of a germanium diode is 0.3 volts. For the exam, you need to know what an advantage of uh, the electrolytic capacitor is. And the advantage is that it's uh, high capacitance given its volume. If you can look here, you can see a, a, a penny uh, in comparison to the little, uh, the little can with the uh, uh, dark side, uh, the dark marking on one side, or the band. Uh, which shows the polarity, by the way. Uh, for the exam, you need to know that an advantage of an electric, uh, electrolytic uh, capacitor is uh, its high capacity for a given volume. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, when we were talking about uh, germanium diodes, um, the uh, approximate junction threshold voltage of a conventional silicon diode is 0.7 volts or 700 millivolts, as we can see by this, uh, this chart. In this photograph, we see a uh, wire-wound resistor. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, wire-wound resistors is they can uh, uh, handle high current and uh, they give off a lot of heat. Um, resistive wire is also used in electric heaters, by the way. Um, for the exam, you need to know that a reason why not to use a wire wound resistor in an RF circuit is that the resistor's uh, inductance could make the circuit perform unpredictably. Uh, so if you can see in the little bands in this photo that where the wire is, you can see that it's actually a coil of wire. So a coil of wire, by definition, is what? It's an inductor. So you do not want an inductor uh, in an RF circuit uh, that you're really trying when you really need a uh, resistor. I get an, a question on your exam that asks, what are the stable operating points for a bipolar transistor used as a switch in a logic circuit? Well, as you can see by the, uh, the chart, uh, you can see that there's a, a saturation point and a cutoff point. Uh, for the exam, you need to know that the stable operating points for a bipolar transistor used as a switch in a logic circuit are its saturation and cutoff points. And that's how you get the on and off uh, state. Another test question from this section is, what is the advantage of using a ferrite core uh, uh, toroidal inductor? Well. The advantages are that the uh, large values of inductance can be obtained uh, because you're using a ferrite core or magnetic core. Uh, the magnetic properties of uh, the core may be uh, optimized for a specific range of frequencies as you can uh, mix and match, you can create uh, magnetic alloys. Uh, and most of the magnetic field is contained within the core, uh, which is a distinct advantage. Uh, so for this question, uh, all the choices are correct. For the exam, you need to know uh, what uh, describes uh, the construction of a MOSFET. Um, if you can see by the little diagram uh, that uh, there's a little metal oxide insulator uh, that's between the, the end channel and the, uh, the metal electrode. Um, so for the exam, you need to know that the, that the gate is separated from the channel with a thin insulating la layer, uh, and that's what describes the construction of a MOSFET. MOSFET, by the way, stands for a Metal Oxide Semiconductor uh, Field Effect Transistor. It may surprise you to know that uh, vacuum tubes are still used today. Um, you'll find them in a lot of the more powerful uh, amplifiers used in uh, amateur radio and uh, also in commercial stations. Um, for the exam, there's a question, uh, which element of the triode vacuum tube, triode meaning three parts, 
uh, is used to uh, regulate the flow of electrons between the cathode and the plate. Well, for the exam, you just need to know that the control grid of a uh, triode vacuum tube is used to regulate the flow of electrons between the cathode and the plate. And you can see it in the, the diagram. There's a test question that confuses some people. Uh, it's what happens when an inductor is operated above its self-resonant uh, frequency. Well, if you recall, resonance is, is where um, something resonates. It, uh, it vibrates at a particular frequency or works at a particular frequency. Um, above a self-resonated uh, frequency, uh, parasitic capacitance becomes dominant and it just takes over. Um, so for the exam, you need to know that when an inductor is operated above its self-resonant frequency, it becomes capacitive. And on the exam, they want you to know uh, what the purpose of a screen grid is in a vacuum tube. And the primary purpose of a screen grid in a vacuum tube is to reduce the grid to plate capacitance. A test question is, why is the polarity of uh, applied voltages important for polarized capacitors? Well, they're important because um, if you uh, incorrectly polarize or, or you put them in backwards, they can cause the uh, capacitor to short circuit or explode in some cases, um, like in the picture. Um, it can uh, reverse uh, voltages can uh, destroy the dielectric layer in the capacitor, so it could just damage it uh, beyond repair. Uh, and the capacitor can overheat and explode. Yeah, did I mention explosion? Uh, back in the day, uh, I worked in a factory and somebody put a large capacitor in that was oil filled uh, and backwards and it exploded and it made a big mess and scared the daylights out of me too. Uh, so for the question, it, all are, the choices are correct. You know how everybody loves a bargain or most people love a bargain? Well, this next question on the exam, which of the following is an advantage of a ceramic capacitor as compared to other types of capacitors? Um, well, the advantage is it's low in cost. So just know for the exam that the advantage of a ceramic capacitor as compared to other types of capacitors is that it has a comparatively low cost. That brings us uh, to analog digital circuits. Uh, memory I.O. or uh, input-output devices, microwave integrated circuits, uh, display devices, connectors, and ferrite cores. Earlier we mentioned that uh, the type of uh, material used in the core can affect its behavior. Um, for the exam you need to know that the composition or mix of materials used is what determines the performance of a ferrite uh, core at different frequencies, as illustrated by this chart. Uh, you can see that uh, material 75 has a totally different behavior than, say, material 45 or material 61. For you science fiction fans, do you remember the monolith on 2001? Okay, well, monolithic means that it's just from uh, a single uh, block. Um, so a monolithic uh, microwave integrated circuit is uh, a circuit that's made from one small flat piece uh, or chip of semiconductor uh, uh, material. Uh, for the exam, you just need to know that a monolithic uh, microwave integrated circuit is what is meant by the term MMIC. An exam question you might get is uh, which of the following is an advantage of uh, CMOS integrated circuits compared to TTL integrated circuits? Well, if you remember, uh, CMOS stands for complementary metal oxide. Uh, TTL stands for transistor-transistor logic. Uh, you can see by the chart the different uh, uh, voltage consumptions or power consumptions. Um, for the exam, just know that the low power consumption is an advantage of CMOS integrated circuit uh, components uh, compared to uh, TTL integrated circuits. Um, you, need, you need to know what is meant by ROM. 
Uh, ROM is uh, read-only memory. Um, in the photo, it's electronically erasable uh, read-only memory, um, which is uh, a more common type. There are types that are, uh, are programmed once, and th th that's all it gets. Uh, but for the exam, just know that uh, uh, read-only memory is what is meant by the term ROM. For the exam, you need to know what is meant by uh, non-volatile memory. Uh, non-volatile memory is just simply a type that uh, it retains uh, its information even when the power is removed. Uh, some examples are solid-state hard drives, memory sticks, and flash memory, uh, whether it be the, uh, uh, the larger or the, the micro versions. Uh, for the exam, just know that the stored information is maintained even if the power is removed is what is meant when memory is characterized as being non-volatile. You might be asked what kind of device is an integrated circuit operational amplifier? Um, well, when it comes to electronics, there's basically two types of device. There's an analog, which has a waveform. Uh, well, actually, a digital signal can have a waveform, but it's, it's, it's square wave rather than uh, a sine wave. So analog devices, we're typically speaking of devices that have a sine wave, uh, whereas digital devices have a square wave or an on-off state. Um, here is a photograph of a surface mount integrated circuit and a diagram that shows it. But for the exam, just know that an analog device is a type of integrated circuit used in an operational amplifier. In ham radio, you need to definitely know the different types of connectors that you might be dealing with. And one of the ones that uh, is common is an N-type connector, which you can see in, in the, the photo. Um, so you need to know what describes it. And uh, for the exam, you just need to know that uh, a moisture-resistant RF connector useful to 10 gigahertz describes a type N connector. And you can see that this would make a nice weather seal and have make a nice, uh, nice connection. Uh, you're asked to, or might be asked on the, the exam, how an LED is biased when it's emitted light, uh, emitting light. Well, um, one thing I'd like to point out about uh, LEDs is if you put it in backwards, you could uh, destroy the LED. Um, so that said, uh, for the exam, you need to know that an LED is forward biased when emitting uh, light, uh, and that's uh, described uh, by this uh, diagram that you see. Also expected to know the characteristics of a, a LCD display or a liquid quartz or a crystal or liquid crystal display LCD. Um, and one of the characteristics is that it can use either ambient or backlighting. Uh, most common, I think, is, is backlighting. Uh, the LCD t televisions definitely have backlighting, and monitors uh, do as well. Uh, before the exam, just know that a characteristic of the liquid crystal display is it utilizes ambient or backlighting. A test question uh, that you might get is, uh, how does a ferrite bead or, or core reduce uh, common mode RF current on the shield uh, of a coax cable. Um, for the exam, you just need to know that uh, it does so by creating an impedance uh, in the current path. Another connector you need to be uh, familiar with is uh, SMA connector, uh, which is uh, a small threaded connector suitable for signals up uh, to several gigahertz. Um, this is uh, the type of connector that's used for the antenna in uh, a lot of the uh, handhelds this day, uh, you know, like the, the Waxen shown here, um, the Bofeng or uh, the Chinese radios and uh, various others uh, are using the SMAs now. Another type of uh, connector you may encounter is uh, the RCA Phono connector. Um, I think it may be more common in uh, vintage 
uh, amateur radio equipment. Uh, you might find it in, a, in some new ones. Um, but for the exam, you need to know that an RCA phono connector is a type that is commonly used for audio signals in amateur radio stations. An extremely common type of uh, connector is the uh, PL259. Uh, the image on the, the right is the back of a Yezu FT818 uh, uh, transceiver, um, and the uh, connector is used for uh, the HF portion of that radio. Um, on, the, on the left is a, a, just a jumper cable. For the exam, you need to know that a PL259 connector is a type that is commonly used for RF connections at uh, frequencies up to 150 megahertz. So basically, uh, from the HF bands up to 70 centimeters. This is the end of uh, Lesson 6. I hope that you've enjoyed today's lesson. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to my channel and like the video if you feel so inclined. If you have any questions or comments, you can put them below. And until next time, stay well, stay safe, and never stop learning.